Welcome to the Council of Trend Podcast, a production of Catholic Answers. My inner seven-year-old is alive and well. I still think dinosaurs are awesome. I enjoy watching fighter jets. And then I love trains. I love watching them. I love riding them. I think they're great. You know who also thinks that they're great? Politicians who are willing to spend your tax dollars on them and waste, in some cases, billions of dollars. That's billions with a B on trains that don't really make a lot of sense, but are fun because maybe those politicians are letting their inner seven-year-olds do the spending uh, instead of more cost-conscious uh, parts of their brains. Uh, so welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Kathy Gantz's apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. And today I want to talk about one thing I love, trains. One thing I'm not particularly fond of, politicians. And that'd be public transit projects. Uh, Politicians love to spend money on uh, all different kinds of projects uh, that they think people would enjoy. And it's unfortunate that many times they spend money on what they think would be a great idea or what certain lobbyists tell them would be a great idea. Instead of taking a step back and finding something that might be, well, you know, a little less glamorous, but would actually be better for people uh, in general. By the way, if you didn't know, this is Free for All Friday. So on Monday and Wednesday, we talk apologetics, we talk theology. Uh, all sorts of things to explain and defend the Catholic faith. But on Friday, well, I just talk about whatever I want to talk about. And there's all different sorts of subjects that I enjoy discussing. And this would be one of them. I just love that it combines one thing that I really enjoy, and that would be trains, transit. Uh, I love figuring out public transit, right? How do you get people from point A to point B? How do you set up the right system? I do think that it's there are cities that do it really well. I mean, nothing really compares to the the New York subway system, for example. Even in San Diego, California, where I used to live, I thought the San Diego Transit Authority was organized really well. They had the coaster. They had that one train that went uh, from Oceanside, California, down to San Diego. And that train was actually somewhat useful because traffic trying to get from downtown San Diego up to Oceanside, it could take hours. But if you rode the train... Uh, I think it could take maybe like 40 minutes. So you could still, if you were using it during rush hour, or if you just wanted a nice scenic tour, uh, you, you a lot of times that particular train, I loved riding it because it went alongside a bluff on the ocean. And the train, you could look down and see the waves crashing against the shore. And that's really fun to be able to do on a train. You, you, you come out of this valley, and then right away, you see the Pacific Ocean, and it's glorious. Though I just found out recently that that particular train, the coaster line, which is also shared by Amtrak and other train lines, is going to have to be moved because the train line is sitting on bluffs uh, that are unstable. That was something we had to worry about, by the way, in in California. Uh, When you go to the, the beaches there, you can't put your chairs or your towels too close to the bluffs on the beach. Uh, so maybe if you've gone to the beaches in the Atlantic or the Gulf Coast, you may not be you know as familiar with this. But in San Diego, uh, the the beaches are right up against bluffs that are you know 40, 30, 40 feet tall. So even if the sea level rises, a lot of the houses there, well, it's not like the seas are going to inundate the houses if sea levels rise because they're sitting on top of these bluffs that are. 20, 30, 40 feet above the ocean. Rather, it's if the sea levels rise or you have more storms and things like that, they eat away at the bluffs and it can crash down on you and bury you in sand and kill you. But So they have to move the train line because the bluffs are collapsing and you got this gigantic train line on top of them. So in some cases, it makes sense. But in other cases, uh, putting trains together, it it doesn't doesn't quite make a lot of sense. I'm going to give you two examples here for me to rail about. (laughs) Ha ha, that was a pun. Uh, the first one is the De- the Detroit People Mover, Detroit City, all right? So according to this article, the Detroit People Mover, the DPM, is a 2.94-mile, so three-mile long, elevated automated people mover system in Detroit, Michigan. The system operates in a one-way loop on a single track encircling downtown Detroit, and it stops at 13 stations in downtown Detroit. But here's the kicker it only goes in one direction. So I don't know if you can call it a train. I want to call it a train because it's a big boxy thing with multiple cars that goes on a track. 
Uh, it, it's automated. So it's sort of like those shuttles at the airport. Uh, we have this at Dallas-Fort Worth. They have a similar one at Atlanta. I think the Detroit airport also has a similar shuttle that goes uh, back and forth along the really long terminals there where it's automated and it's a people mover. So it's only two cars. So it's multiple cars. So it's two cars. Doors automatically open and close. There's no uh, driver for the train. And so it just it just circles. And in some places, that kind of technology works. They also have it at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. So a small one or two mile loop at an airport where you have constant traffic and you need to get from one terminal to another, uh, that makes sense to have a kind of people mover technology. But the Detroit people mover, it is expensive. Uh, A word that can be used to describe many high-speed rail projects and has been used frequently to describe the next one that I'm going to talk about is boondoggle. These things are often boondoggles. People think, oh, this is going to be a great idea to have. It's going to really revitalize the city. And people just think, you know, having these trains or these elevated cars, it's the city of the future, people. Uh, having, you know, these automated people movers sh- shuttling people around. No, the problem is uh, people, they don't use it. So here's a clip from a Business Insider video uh, with people talking about the people mover, how even the, the people who live in Detroit, you know, they, they like it, but they admit uh, nobody uses it. There's people that live downtown and that's how they get to work every morning. Real convenient. I think it's a great thing for the city of Detroit. I think it's very underutilized, though. In fact, it's so underutilized that the Detroit Transportation Corporation, the company responsible for the people mover, is spending nearly four dollars for each and every trip taken on the people mover. It's like anything else in the city of Detroit. Nothing makes money here. So the problem is the people mover is just not cost effective. And that happens a lot with train projects. Uh, They're fun. They're glamorous. But in reality, a bus is just going to be a lot more cost effective. And if you can fix that for people, that just makes a lot of sense. And there's other places, though, where they've built the system to be functional, to actually help people. And that is cost effective. So uh, it says here, according to this article, in every year between 1997 and 2006, the cost per passenger mile exceeded $3 and was $4.26 in 2009. So it cost the city of Detroit to move somebody one mile on the people mover in 2009. It was $4.26. It requires $12 million in Detroit and Michigan subsidies to run the people mover. To make that a comparison, you, to use a bus, uh, for the city to, to take you a mile in a bus in Detroit, which I don't recommend, but you know, you do the best you can, costs 82 cents. The New York City subway system, which is a marvel of public transit and engineering, 30 cents per passenger mile. So uh, to move you one mile in the New York City subway, it's New York, it costs New York 30 cents. One mile in a Detroit bus, 82 cents. One mile on the Detroit People Mover can cost four dollars. It's incredibly wasteful. Uh, the Mackinac Center for Public Policy charges that the system does not even benefit locals, pointing out that fewer than thirty percent of the riders are Detroit residents, and that Saturday ridership, likely out of towners, dwarfs that of weekday usage. So you create something you claim is going to help. You're spending tax dollars uh, that could go to public services to help local people who live there. But instead, the tax dollars are wasted on a amenity that is primarily used by tourists. You know, you're going to Detroit for a, an expo or for a conference, and you're downtown, and you got nothing better to do, so you might as well ride the people mover around the loop just to see the city. Or you're not in a rush, so you'll ride the people mover to get somewhere instead of walking or taking an Uber. Edward Glazer in his 2011 book, Triumph of the City, referring to the high cost of maintenance for the people mover, because, by the way, because it's an automated people mover, a lot of times its parts are difficult to come by. It can be difficult to uh, uh, fix it and to keep it maintained. It ca- he calls the people mover perhaps the most absurd public transit project in the country. Or is it? Because the next one I'm going to talk about is California High Speed Rail. That one, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the Detroit People Mover doesn't make sense. The California High Speed Rail Project is one that does not make sense and refuses to die. It is an absolute embarrassment for the state of California. Uh, but like I said, just make a bus. Yeah, it doesn't sound as cool. We're going to unleash a new line of high speed buses. You know, it's not as glamorous as a train or a people mover, but actually fixing buses to get people to go places. 
that makes a lot of sense. Like when I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, they spent all this money on the light rail. All right. So I remember when it debuted and people got up to to ride it. And I had friends who lived in the east side of Phoenix. This is when I worked at the uh, the pastoral center for the Diocese of Phoenix. And I worked under Bishop Olmsted at the time when he was uh, when he was the Bishop of Phoenix. So he just retired. He hasn't officially transferred yet. But when I worked at the Diocese of Phoenix, there was, um, you know, the, the Pastoral Center was in downtown Phoenix. And a lot of people who worked at the Pastoral Center lived 20 miles away, probably 10 miles away, 15, in eastern part of the Phoenix metropolitan area. So that would be places like Chandler, Gilbert, Mesa, uh, some people in Scottsdale, you know, the people who lived on the west side, but a lot of people, and myself included, lived on the east side of town. And so you need to commute to work. Phoenix traffic is ugly in the morning. There's not a ton of freeways there. Phoenix got into the the interstate freeway game very late. Uh, people were spooked by freeways. So they didn't build them quite as early as other Metroplex areas. And so now, you know, they're building more and more freeways there. But it's to get from the East County into downtown Phoenix, it is rough. And so I know some people who have tried the light rail. You get on the light rail and you want it, and you see just try to take that in from Mesa to get into downtown Phoenix. And it stinks. It takes almost as long, if not longer sometimes, to take the light rail. Because a lot of these train systems, they go, you have, they're not near, the stations are not near where you live. So you still have to drive to the station. You got to park your car. You got to wait for the train to come. And it stops at every single, everybody lobbies to have a station to have the train stop at or the shuttle or the light rail. And it takes forever just to get anywhere. And it also has to stop for red lights uh, in a lot of traffic crossings. It's not on a high uh, platform that just overshoots everything. So it's not a train in that sense. It oftentimes has to stop for traffic. And also, frankly, there's a lot of crime. I remember once I rode the light rail for fun, the last time I rode it for fun, uh, just to try it out. And I got off at a downtown Phoenix station, and a guy started to sell me drugs in front of a cop. And the cop looked over, and then he looked back, and he walked away. And the guy, I'm telling you, he was selling me drugs. He said, hey, man, I got some special stuff here. And he showed me a bag of powders. Like, you want some of this? And I'm like, and I'm like oh, my goodness. Thank goodness my D.A.R.E. training came in uh, from 1991. <laughs> that, that D.A.R.E. police officer, Gruff McGruff the crime dog, told me to just say no. I was like, uh, I'm okay. And then I um, then I walked away. So, uh, And that's what's hard with a lot of public transit, too. People, you know, people say, well, why don't more people use public transit? A lot of people do use public transit. Because there are cities where you have uh, prosecutors that have more left-wing ideas. You got more politics in your podcast. You weren't supposed to do that. Well, sorry. Okay, it's free fall Friday. I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. And they decriminalize things. They don't want to you know, hurt the poor. And instead, what happens is that the poor get hurt because a lot of uh, criminals or other people, not great characters, end up on public transit because left-wing prosecutors won't uh, prosecute fair uh, violations, people who ride the transit uh, and don't pay. And so what ends up happening is the public transit gets overrun by people who uh, disrupt other riders or are dangerous or have engaged in criminal behavior, and you don't want to be there. And so uh, honestly, I see that more on uh, light rails and trains and trolleys than I do on buses. I don't ride buses very much. But in Phoenix, you know, there's a light rail, and or you can try the bus. And the buses are just awful. You want to wait in 110 degree weather for a sporadic bus that you have to transfer and you can't even get anywhere anyways. You might as well have taken your car because it gets stuck in traffic as well. And so that's what happens in Los Angeles. This is an article uh, published in Reason Magazine back in 2019. The headline of the article says, LA bus riders are suffering. Rail spending is to blame. And so they're talking about uh, the bus system in Los Angeles and says uh, one person interviewed says, on the bus, I just can't get from point A to point B whenever I need to go. I hate it, said one 23-year-old commuter to the Los Angeles Times, saying she can spend up to five hours a day commuting by bus to and from school. Another woman told the Times she spends three hours a day on the bus getting to her job as a house cleaner. She says she and her husband are saving to buy a car. Uh... The report by UCLA says that average bus speeds have fallen 12.5% over the last 25 years. So you tried to get out of traffic. Uh, you would think you could create a dedicated, with all the money, the, the millions or billions that are spent on trains, you think it could be spent on buses just to have a dedicated bus lane 
the high-speed bus lane, or even if traffic's at a standstill, these buses can move people up and down very quickly. And buses are a lot easier to, to send places and go and pick people up uh, than trains. Uh, but it says here the L.A. Metro, uh, since 1985, has spent $25 billion building a rail transit system. Uh, at the same time, bus ridership has fallen by nearly 220 million trips a year, uh, dragging down overall transit because the bus system stinks. You might say, oh, well, they're all going on the rail, right? No. Uh, rail ridership has been declining despite Metro continuing to open new rail line extensions. And so... Uh, once again, you, you have the problem here. You spend all this money on trains, and they're doing it for the 2028 Olympics. That could be another free-for-all Friday, by the way. Cities that host the Olympics is the greatest scam in the world. They spend millions or billions of dollars on new stadiums, new public transit, thinking the Olympics will bring in all kinds of revenue, and it never does. Uh, the Olympics are the gift you immediately want to pass on. But they love it. People love uh, trains, and they don't want to let them go. This is another article from April 2021 uh, where President Biden is talking about, and that's the problem. They, they just have these dreams of trains, and you have Joe Biden. I, I, I rode the Amtrak every day from Delaware into, you know, into Washington. Come on, man. Come on. Uh, and he said uh, at the White House, he said, uh, imagine a world where you and your family can travel coast to coast without a single tank of gas on a high-speed train close to as fast as you can go across the country in a plane. That's, that's not possible. That's not going to be possible. A passenger airliner can travel 500 miles an hour. The fastest train in the world uh, experimentally ran at 357 miles per hour. But trains are not efficient running that fast, uh, and you can only do it for short bursts. Uh, the fastest train in the world right now is in China that runs continually. It runs a little less than 200 miles an hour. But the trains, you just can't. Like, imagine trying to get from Los Angeles to Washington on a train, even if it was going 200 miles an hour, and it did not stop. It would take you 10 or 12 hours if you were running at Chinese or Japanese bullet train speed. Whereas if you got on a plane, you could get there in five hours. And of course, the problem is, why would you, why would you take a train that far? Trains make sense in places like Europe, where they have trains to everywhere there. And it's a small place, and you can, go, you can zip around to different cities really fast on these trains. But in the United States of America, to try to get anywhere, you have to lay a ton of track, and it's not dedicated track. You have to share it with a freight train usually, which means you have to stop to allow freight trains to pass, or you have to go slowly in areas uh, because you're going across uh, crossing paths. Uh, so you can't be running at 200 miles an hour. If you're going to be interacting in places where cars cross the path, you have to be going slower, something more like 80. <laughs> It just wouldn't work. You would you would end up stopping in so many places. If you want to take the Amtrak across the country, it takes multiple days. That's fine if you want to go on some kind of scenic tour. But if you want to get from point A to point B, you just take a train. No, sorry, you just take a plane. And that's the problem with the California high-speed rail. This is the dream, the dream of Governor Jerry Brown and now Gavin Newsom, is to run a high-speed train from Los Angeles to San Francisco. Why anyone would want to go to San Francisco, I have no idea. L.A. is almost getting as bad. And the idea here is, oh, wouldn't it be amazing to connect these? Because the, why, why do they want to do it? Because California is run by L.A. and San Francisco. You live in any other part of the country, you, uh, part of the state, you don't get represented. This, California is basically San Francisco and Los Angeles. San Diego is still a big voice, but those two cities basically run the entire state. And so they say, let's, con let's unite our power. And so let's connect them on a, uh, you know, you connect them on a, a high-speed rail. And if you just were told, these are two really big, uh, the two biggest cities in California, uh, you could connect them with a train that could get you there faster and cheaper than a plane, should we do it? If that's all you heard, you might think, yeah, that would be a great idea. But then when you actually look into it, it's a terrible idea, because you can't run a straight flat line from LA to San Francisco. There are these large mountains in the way, a mountain. You have to navigate the train around the mountain. You have to go up the central California Valley to swoop in to get into San Francisco. 
And so when you actually look in real life what can be done with rail technology, it takes longer and it will be more expensive, a, a train ride, and it will take longer than just getting on a plane and going there. Uh, so it doesn't make sense. So here's a editorial in the Las Vegas Review Journal in back in February of 2022 talking about the California High Speed Rail project. And it says Webster's Dictionary might as well change the spelling of boondoggle to high speed rail. See a lot look it up. Lots of people call it a boondoggle. Earlier this month, California High Speed Rail released its 2022 business plan. It's more than 100 pages long, but it can be summed up in three words. Keep wasting money. The Los Angeles project now tops $105 billion. That's up more than $5 billion. From a similar report the authority released last year, California, by the way, has the highest homeless rate in the country. You think $105 billion could probably go to help homeless people uh, a lot more than for a train uh, nobody needs. And so everybody's either could keep asking for uh, all kinds of money. In, 2000 e- in 2008, a $10 billion bond funding for high-speed rail, Californians voted, Californians voted because they always vote for things against their own interest, for $10 billion for the high-speed rail. At the time, they were told high-speed rail would cost $40 billion. The editorial writes, that was a crock. Uh, and now it's over $105 billion and it's going to keep getting more expensive. And everything's wrong. It says it was supposed to start operating in twenty in 2020. It's 2022, but no track has been laid. You can't blame the pandemic. It was supposed to be running when the pandemic started, but no track has even been laid since then. As it stands, the first portion of the track for California high-speed rail will be a 119-mile line that runs through the Central Valley. That's supposed to turn into a 175-mile stretch from Merced to Bakersfield. Fine cities but hardly the thriving metropolises this project once promised to connect. So they're going to start with the easy part, which is this California Central Valley. It's flat. You can run the train track along the I-5, but the I-5 doesn't get a lot of traffic in Central California in the interior valley. So you might as well just drive a car. It doesn't make sense. Also, by the time you, you take the train down, you get to Merced or Bakersfield, there is no great public transit there. So how are you going to get from the train station where you're going? You're going to need to take a cab, an Uber, or a bus, which is either expensive or inefficient, and you'll wish you had your car. So next time, you'll just drive your car, and you know, won't, you'll, you'll, it'll take a little bit longer than a train, but you'll have the flexibility of having your car with you uh, because maybe you don't want to take the bus in Bakersfield. Uh, so it just doesn't make sense. These are two tiny not tiny, they're tiny compared to LA and San Francisco, but they don't need a high-speed rail line. A regular rail, they have a regular rail line. Amtrak already does that. Once, this was actually fun, I gave a talk in San Francisco, and then I had to give a talk in Bakersfield the next day. So instead of taking a plane, I would have taken me five hours by plane because there was no direct flight to Bakersfield. I had to go to Phoenix and over. I took a three-hour train ride from San Francisco to Bakersfield on Amtrak, and it was just pleasant and lovely. You don't need a high-speed rail. You already have Amtrak. You could just do that. And finally, it says, by 2040, the report says there is a 99.4% chance of profitability if the system runs from San Francisco to Anaheim. Don't believe it. (laughs) That's just, that's funny. Ah, public transit dreams and nightmares sponsored by your local wasteful politician. Because here's the thing. When you spend your own money on something that you want, you make sure that it's cheap and good. When you spend somebody else's money, or sorry, when you spend your money on something for somebody else, okay, you make sure that it's cheap and it may not be the greatest thing, all right? You're not as worried about quality because, unless it's a gift for someone, but if you have to buy something for somebody else, you know, it doesn't, um, you don't care as much about the quality. Uh, if you're spending somebody else's money and it's for you, well, you want to make sure, you'll make sure it's high quality, but it's not going to be as expensive, right? So this is first, second, and third order purchases. First order, if it's your money and it's for you, you make sure it's cheap and good. If it's your money and it's for somebody else, uh, it's going to be uh, cheap because it's your money, but it's not necessarily going to be good. If it is someone else's money and it's for you, uh, it's going to be good. It may not be cheap. The worst situation you have is when you have somebody, when they're spending somebody else's money 
for other people, which is what politicians do all the time, then they stop caring about it being either cheap or good. And that is the mess that we end up in with a lot of political projects. So hope that was helpful for you. Hope you enjoyed a little free for all Friday time. And hey, if you happen to live in Detroit or maybe you live in California, you ride the coaster, you ride the Detroit people mover, do let me know uh, in the comments section. Uh, Do check us out at trendhornpodcast.com. Thank you guys. And I hope you have a very blessed day. If you like today's episode, become a premium subscriber at our Patreon page and get access to member-only content. For more information, visit trendhornpodcast.com.